Amen. Good morning. We're in a series that we've called Limitless, and it's this move from our very limited power based on our own capacity and uh, ability to change our circumstances or to do anything in this life compared to God's limitless power and ability to do all that he says uh, that he will do. Last week, Rusty Hudson, our senior pastor, set us up for what kind of where we're going over the course of the series and how our Sunday morning experience here in worshiping together in this room relates to what's going on in what we've called host homes, uh, 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 short-term community groups where we are studying through uh, Mark Batterson's book called If, and we're watching some videos. And so our sermon series on Sunday morning is very much uh, intentionally related to what will be discussed in host homes. So yeah, if you're new to that whole idea of a community group, this is a great way to experience community in a home uh, with a group of people. And you're, if, you're, if you're not sure, sure about the whole community thing, we are already a weekend, so you've only got four weeks to go. So um, there's really not uh, any reason we should not all be in some kind of community in that way. And it really is our hope that as a whole church, We'll do that. So if you're interested in signing up uh, to be in one of those groups, you can find out more information in the lobby about that. My name is Lee Cadden, and I'm one of our pastors here on staff, and I'm excited about where we're going over the course of these next few weeks. We set up last week uh, and kind of looked forward into this week and the weeks beyond of this series of a study really working through what is Paul teaching us in Romans chapter 8. And so this morning we're going to start in chapter 8, verse 1, and work through the first nine verses. So if you have your Bible... Go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, want a Bible, we'd love to give you one before you leave here uh, today. But if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Uh, and I, I want to set us up a little bit before we jump into the Word specifically. In this Christian life, we have an incredible opportunity and privilege on a, on a daily basis to choose the way of God or the way of the world, to choose uh, whether we're going to align our own life with God's desire for us, the thing, to be the people that He both made us to be and saved us to be. And as believers, we have an incredible capacity, an incredible privilege to choose one way or the other on a, on a daily basis. But I believe at some point in our life, and sometimes it's, it's weekly, sometimes it's very pivotally in moments. Is that a word, pivotally? It's a word now. Well, there's, there are moments in our life where we choose things that, that alter the course of our life. And I believe oftentimes those changes are some, a big moment in our life, uh, often wraps around this question in some way, shape, or form. is God, what do you want for my life? Like, I've been doing this thing for a really long time, but genuinely, Lord, what do, what do you want for my life? What are your dreams for my life? When you made me and saved me and looked down on me at my birth, when you saw my life coming, what were the things that you saw me doing? Lord, what are your dreams for my life? When I think about the limitless life, which is what we're studying over the course in the sermon series that we're working through here on Sunday mornings, uh, it's really at going from and, and, and changing our mindset, so to speak, uh, from one thing to another. And so this is the way it works in my mind. It's, God, where am I living? Where am I acting based on my dreams and my power? And, and in those places, Lord, Lord, help me. Give me the strength, the courage, the faith. Change in me even the places that I need to exchange my dreams and my ability with your dreams and your ability in me by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that big shift is what we're talking about over the course of this series of moving from the limited life of the flesh and of this world and to, to the limitless life that, that God would have for us. I believe John the Baptist was on to it when he said, and maybe even more so than he even knew at the time, as he's telling his disciples that he must increase and I must decrease. I think that's the, the key, the, the underlying principle of the kingdom life is that Jesus must always be increasing in my life and therefore I must always be decreasing in this life. But we know and believe that we live in a world that's incredibly broken and temptations abound. And so at the beginning of Romans chapter 8, Paul is making a big shift out of Romans chapter 7. And so I want to set up what he's going to say in chapter 1 for us. He goes to this whole section, and it may be incredibly famous for you. It may bring comfort or it may terrify you, which it does both for me. We'll get there in a minute. But um, there's this back and forth that Paul describes between the things in his flesh and in his spirit, the things that he wants to do that he doesn't do and the things that he doesn't want to do that he keeps on doing. And he talks about this war that is raging between the two people, the old man and the new man. The old man continually wants what the old man wants, right? It continually wants my agenda, my way, things that promote me. And the new man says, no, that's not the way that leads to life. Jesus' way is the way that leads to life. And Paul sets this war up, this back and forth between the flesh and the spirit. And then in verses 24 and 25, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death, he calls it. 
And he says in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is through salvation and knowing Jesus Christ our Lord that we are set free from this body of death, Paul says. But I said at the beginning of setting this up that it's both comforting and terrifying. And I say comforting because it truly is an incredible thing, this salvation, right? Like Jesus died and saved me once for all of my sins, both the ones that I committed before my salvation, the day of my salvation, and every day thereafter. And then every day beyond this day that he wakes me up, Jesus' grace is continually sufficient. It is incredibly comforting to know that there is nothing that separates the believer from the love of God. There's nothing that separates him from us because of what Christ has accomplished. But I say that it's also terrifying because these words of this war that wages back and forth is continually, I don't always do the things I know I should do, and I definitely don't do all the things that I know I could do, and and, and, and I keep doing the things that I know I'm not supposed to, this back and forth. It's terrifying for me because this is the Apostle Paul, right? Like if anybody should have figured this life out as he's writing the letter to the Romans, and as he's writing what would be considered one of his greatest letters, just kind of the backbone of everything else that he would write or preach, it's terrifying to me to think that if he couldn't figure out, I'm for sure not going to figure this thing out. But Paul, over and over and over again as he's writing to the churches in that day, doesn't ever say that he's arrived that he's been made perfect. He tells the churches over and over again, listen, my life is in process and it's ugly sometimes and it's good sometimes and I rejoice and then I'm in pain and all the things, everything in between on all spectrums of the circumstances of Paul's life were going on, but he still said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What Paul knew, what we know is that Jesus intended for all of history before, from the time he was here until the time he would come back that our lives be a process worth imitating as we learn to rely on Christ's strength in our life and not on our own. He believed and said to the churches as Paul was, as, as the Holy Spirit was writing through him that this life is about the process of going from limited to limitless about exchanging me and mine for God and his on a daily and ongoing basis. So If Paul faithfully ran his race and continued to fight the good fight, the encouragement for us would be to do the same. And so what specifically, when we think about what Paul is talking about in chapter 7, what is he talking about when he talks about this whole, I don't do this and I want to, I do do this and I don't want to, this back and forth over and over again. If if you look at scripture, really and truthfully, sin can be categorized in, in two main buckets or two main categories and the first is very simply sins of commission these are the things that we tend to think about when we look at our life and realize okay the things that I'm doing aren't lining up with the way that God would have me live and so I do this thing I commit this sin and I realize that's wrong thank you for grace and I move on or for the first time we come to salvation and go all these things that I've done oh my goodness yes grace Jesus your way not my way that's sins of commission the things that we do but Paul also talks in this same passage about sins of omission the things that he knows that he should do and doesn't do because of this war that's going on in his life. I believe at the end of Paul's life, and I believe at the end of everyone's life, and probably whether you're a believer or not, looking at the scope of your life at the end of it, the things that you will look back at and regret most are not the things that you did, but the things that you left undone. The chances you didn't take. The moments where faith said, jump, and you said, ugh. This feels real good right now, and I've kind of got this good thing going. So much about the Christian life is about looking at what's going on and going, okay, Lord, thank you for grace for that. I'm moving on from the things that I commit, but I'm also looking at, by faith, all of the things that you have before me. And I don't have to have all of the answers to say, you know what? Faith says, go and do. Faith says, say hey to that person. Faith says, love that person, even though you're probably going to get rejected. Faith says, take a chance, even though you don't have all of it, simply because the Holy Spirit says, go. And I'm with you. I'm for you. I believe it's not our failures in this life that we'll regret most. Because I think we can look back at the things we did and go, Jesus, thank you for grace. That deserved death. But you loved me. You saved me. But it's the things that we left undone, the chances we didn't take. Now, let me be clear that the grace covers all of that. But I believe that it was Christ's aim and hope when he said, I long to give you the abundant life, the limitless life that we would finish this race, as I believe Paul is doing here, with no regrets, believing we laid it all out on the line for the sake of the kingdom. That's the same call to the church today for us these thousands of years later. So Paul teaches us 
that there are really two types of things that break the Lord's heart, right? There's the things that we know full well are sinful and we choose to do them anyway, but there's also a failure sometimes, oftentimes for me in my own life to trust him, to stick my neck out there, to go and love that person, to go and do that thing, a failure to take the risk that I know that the Holy Spirit is prompting me to take. I had a recent conversation with a brother here in our church who's um, very comfortable in his job and he had this new opportunity and, and as we're sitting there kind of going through the pros and cons of it, what we realize is that God wasn't giving him a very clear, like, this is the way, this is not the way. And so my question to him, which is often the case for us, right? So my question to him was, was simply, you know, 10 years from now, when you're talking with your son, which one would you regret not doing? And I believe that's a very simple illustration, a very simple um, example of the life of faith so oftentimes is we have these moments where we know that God's leading us to do something. I mean, we'd be a people that never ignore that, right? That say, you know what? I'm going to take this step even though I don't have all of the information. I'm going to love this person regardless of whether they love me back because that's exactly how Jesus loved us. The life of the flesh, this old way that Paul is talking about, is typically fear-based. It's fear of what might happen. It's fear of the unknown. It's fear of rejection. It's fear of failure. It's fear of what people are going to think about me if I choose to say or do that. And the life of the new self, this new creation, is a life of faith that says, you know what? It's not my power or my will or my agenda that matters here. It's his coming in and through me that matters most. Yes, the Christian life is about resisting temptation from time to time. That's absolutely important for our holiness. And Paul's not downplaying or minimizing that. But what he is saying in putting these two types of sins together, the things we do and the things that we fail to do, he's telling you, listen, he's telling me and you and everyone who would read this letter and hear these words, that this Christian life is about wholehearted pursuit. Everything you've got, no area of your left, not submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's about wholehearted hearted pursuit of the kingdom of God in and through your life. That's what it means to follow me, Jesus would say. Every area of your life. So if we're going to live from this kind of place, right, like there has to be some sort of switch. There has to be some sort of um, shift, so to speak, in our minds as to how we view this Christian life and how we view our day to day. Something major has to change if we're in Romans chapter 7 with this back and forth, and it's really this merry go round of, of sinfulness where we, we feel like we're good one day and then we find ourselves, well, I'm right back in the same spot and I haven't really done anything or changed. Jesus is saying, I know, and here's why. Something major has to change. And so that's where Paul is in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says this There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This life that you keep living over and over again, and he's talking about believers, being a believer in Romans chapter 7, right? This choosing between the flesh and the spirit. Listen, there's no condemnation for you. Why? Because you're in Christ Jesus. You are no longer your own. Yes, you still have this temptation, but this is now who you are in him because of what he has done for you. How is that possible? Why would he do that? He goes on in verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Summed up very simply, the commandments of God, the law, the requirements for a perfect and holy life have never changed. They've always been the same, and they always will be the same because God's word is lasting, it's permanent, it's forever. But because of sin and because of the condition we were born into, we were powerless to uphold those requirements. So God says, not okay, and comes in the form of Christ Jesus to live in the likeness of sinful flesh. To, what that means is he knows exactly what we're going through. He knows exactly what we're dealing with. He knows exactly that on a daily basis you have a choice to make about following the way of God or following the way of this world. And he upholds it perfectly. Why? So that the righteous requirements of the law would be fulfilled in him and then he could give them to you and to me. You see that in taking on all of our sin and simultaneously fulfilling all of the requirements of the law, Jesus then has the authority to say life where there was death. Freedom where there was bondage. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in 
Christ Jesus. You see, there is something absolutely incredible that happens in the life of a believer when he says yes to the things of God. Because at one point, you were condemned because of sin. But you have been declared not guilty because of what Jesus has accomplished on your behalf and my behalf. And now you are free to live with that kind of power inside of you because of the Holy Spirit. Mercy says you are no longer condemned to death. And grace says you have been given life. You have been given freedom. You have been given salvation. You have been given the kingdom. But here's the reality, right? Tomorrow is Monday. Monday always brings what Monday brings, right? And then Tuesday brings what Tuesday brings. The question for us is if we don't feel that kind of life, if we don't feel that kind of freedom, if we don't feel alive with that kind of hope today and tomorrow and every day that Jesus wakes us up, take heart because the Bible says it's because of where your eyes and your mind are set and not because of your condition. Your identity is free, redeemed, saved. There is no condemnation. But we wake up tomorrow with the same war raging around us. I believe it's because so often we tend to look at what's going on around us and our own ability to do something about it instead of looking at what Jesus has done and his ability to handle it. It's a matter of where we set our mind, where we fix our eyes. Unfortunately, though, as believers, we all too often know this merry-go-round, right? We know what we're talking about when we talk about, I know the things I'm supposed to do, and I look at the things that Jesus asks me to do and the privilege that I have to do those things, and yet I still go down this road, or I'm still living in fear of not jumping out in faith and taking that chance. You see, the difference, and this is a big difference, between condemnation and conviction is that conviction says there is a guilt over unconfessed sin. Confess those things to Jesus. Thank him for grace and move on. Condemnation is feeling guilty over the things that you've confessed. And the enemy goes, that's right. This is where you deserve to be. The enemy says, you know what? I think grace is for everybody else. I'm not real sure Jesus died for you. I don't really think that Jesus loves you the way that he loves everyone else. You keep struggling with the same thing over and over and over again. Do you really love him? That's condemnation. Kicking you when you're down. And the truth is that without Jesus, he's absolutely right. If Christ hadn't done what only Christ could have done, this would be true. We would be guilty. But amazingly, in Christ, we have hope because he condemned sin and sinful flesh. Meaning he conquered sin finally for all who believe and declare him Lord. That is the hope of our salvation, right? So Paul says it this way, just to put it a few different ways. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So here's a practice for your Monday morning. Wake up tomorrow and say, You, looking in the mirror, are the righteousness of God. Live like it. And go throughout your day. You are the righteousness of God because of what Christ has accomplished on your behalf. Or just previous to that in verse 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Your old man is dead. You just still have to live with him for the rest of your life. And for the rest of my life, I feel like I'm going to continually be expanding. This way is my body kind of falls apart. And it's just this continual perpetual decay of this body that is in this world right now. But my spirit is alive in him. And so daily on an ongoing basis, we have this incredible opportunity to say, New creation, righteousness of God, live like you believe it. No matter what comes your way. No matter what temptation you face in this life but the question is how do we live like that right like that's easy for us to say together here as we gather and worship so Paul goes on in Romans chapter 8 verses 5 and 6 and I believe this is where his message hinges he says for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life There's not a single one of us in this room that doesn't know what it feels like to set your mind on the things of this world and it fail. To have all of your hopes set on a well that is dry. To run down a path that when you get to the end of it promised one thing and it delivered a very different thing. 
But he says to set your mind on the spirit is life and peace. I need life and peace. We all need life and peace. As new creations, not only have we been given a new heart in Christ, we've been given new eyes to see the things of God. And with that, with our eyes being able to look on the things of God, we have the capacity to set our mind on the things of God. That's the switch. That's the thing that has to take place. Is I'm going to wake up tomorrow if Jesus wakes me up, and I'm going to have the opportunity to set my eyes and my mind on the things that this world says are right or on the things that Jesus says are right. And it will make all the difference for the rest of that day. I find day in, day out with my kids and with my wife that the day I wake up, and I set my mind on the Lord and I spend maybe it's five minutes before a kid wakes up at 525 or whatever the case is. When I set my mind on him and I choose to say, today is yours, Jesus, live in and through me. I'm far less short with the rest of them for the rest of the day. But the days that I set my mind on my own ability to handle that day, whew, the dog runs away from me. Right? You know it's bad when the dog runs away from you. Every day that we wake up, we have a choice to set our mind on what Jesus has done and what he's doing in our lives and in the world around us and the role that we have to play in his kingdom coming here. Or we set our mind on the things of the flesh, my old ways, my capacity, my agenda. Andy Stanley has a book called The Principle of the Path, and it's very simply, it's a very simple book, but the whole idea is that if you get to a destination, it's because you were on a path to that destination. When you get to the end, there, there's a reason you got here because you made choices along the way that led to this place. And I think the same is true spiritually for us. So oftentimes we can look at our lives and, and the, the, the bottom that we find ourselves in or the, the road of, of hope and joy and life and peace that we find ourselves on and realize it's because today we woke up and said Jesus or we woke up and said me and all of a sudden we get to the end of that and realize it was everything we hoped it would be or it was nothing that it said it would be. All of life is a path. But that path is one day at a time. I think as believers or as people, really, we kind of look at the end goal. Like when you set a resolution in December knowing that it's coming in January, you're looking at it going, I am going to lose 25 pounds and be able to run an eight and a half minute mile for 17 miles. You're looking down the road, right? What, you sh what I should be looking at is tomorrow I'm going to go run a mile because you haven't run in six months and it's going to be awful and you're going to run a 12 minute mile, but that's okay because today you woke up and went for a run. And tomorrow you'll do the same, and tomorrow, the day after that you'll do the same again. That's how we look at our life oftentimes, right? Like we look down the road, and I think Jesus is saying, listen, that's way down the road, and it's a great goal, and goals are good, but that goal should define how you live today. To wake up today and look at the choice and the option that you have to pursue me and my kingdom or you and yours. We tend to focus so oftentimes on our actions. We tend to focus on getting to that place and and and. and developing you know habits and patterns and all of these things in our life and yes there is a place and a time for action and a way that we respond to who God is and what he's done and we're going to go there over the course of, of the rest of our study of limitless through the chapter uh, to through the rest of Romans chapter 8 but today we're looking at the starting point for that of what it looks like to move from limited to limitless and it starts in our minds I have to wake up and decide today I'm setting my mind on Jesus and not on this world that's the switch because here's what always happens when we set our eyes on the things of God all of a sudden, our heart cares for the things of God. When our heart cares for the things of God, our life looks like we care about the things of God. And all of a sudden, we wake up and go, okay, I'm not perfect by any means, and I still have this temptation to go back down this road, but, man, I've been for, for day and or days and days and days in a row looking at Jesus and considering him, and my life feels like it's alive for the first time. That's the point. And the same is true in the opposite, right? Like if we go down a road that leads to death, day after day after day after day, all of a sudden, we realize there's chaos and brokenness all around me and in me truly we don't start with our actions we start with our eyes and our mind and we choose to set our mind on the things that are above not on the things of this world life change starts here and that affects here remembering what God has done right not with our salvation salvation is because of what Christ has done in us but our daily choosing him starts with setting our eyes and our mind on him to live as he would have us live. And I believe that 100% of the time, this setting of our mind will indirectly always lead to change in our life, to change in the choices we make, to change in the things that we jump out in faith and do, not because we know all the answers, because we simply say, Jesus said go and love people, so I'm going to go 
and love people, not knowing exactly how this is going to go. In verses 7 8, Paul reiterates that the flesh cannot please God because the flesh always wants what the flesh wants, and that's contrary to, what the, things, to the things of God and what God wants for us. So we don't choose these things in our flesh. We choose these things according to our spirit. And then in verse 9, there is an incredibly hopeful reminder. He says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, which is true for everyone who believes that Jesus is who he says he is and has done what he says he has done on our behalf, if God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And so for those of us who are believers in this place, we look at that and we go, okay, yes, that's it. Amen. I am no longer in the flesh. But if you're sitting there looking at that and considering him, that's the invitation. It's the invitation to live a life that is according to the Spirit and His will and not my own. It's an invitation to a higher, better, greater, lasting for eternity kind of life. And it doesn't matter where we find ourselves. We all have the choice to look at that and go the way of the flesh and me or the way of the Lord and Him and consider the outcome. Consider where that path leads. In Romans 8, 9, Paul says, You are not in the flesh, church. You are of the Spirit. You are alive and free in Him. You are no longer condemned. You are no longer limited by your flesh and your own capacity to affect the change you so desperately desire. You belong to Him who has accomplished all of that. Who has accomplished everything on your behalf when you never deserved it and still don't. You are of the Spirit, and you belong to Him. This is the limitless life. And it's a daily choice to wake up tomorrow and say, I am new in Christ, and no matter what comes my way today, because it's going to come, right? The temptation is going to be there. The waves are going to go up, and it may not even be sinful temptation. It may just be circumstances around you because of the world we live in. The temptation is going to be to handle it on your power or to rely on on God's in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. I am new in Christ. So number two, today I set my mind on Him. I read your word. I pray. I thank you. I live by faith in you that you are doing all that you say you are doing in my life and that you do love me as much as you say you love me regardless of what the enemy would try to convince you of otherwise. I'm new in Christ. I set my mind on Him and the life that he would have me live and his power in me and remind ourselves daily that I am free to live in him according to what his desires are not what my desires are I believe that the last thing any of us wants truly is at the end of this life to look back in regret to wish we had done this or to wish we had done that or to wish we had loved more or to wish we had taken that chance and the truth is grace covers all of those misses right for everything that is behind, all of our sin of commission, all of our things that we left undone and omission. Grace grace covers all of that, and that's a good thing. But we have today, and God willing, we get tomorrow. And every single day that we wake up, we choose to set our mind on the things of God, reminding ourselves one day at a time, you are forgiven, you are loved, you are free. Live like you believe it. Love like you believe it. Because he has called you to an abundant, limitless life by his power, his spirit in you. Amen? So one of the things that we're going to do every week with our sermons is uh, we're going to ask a few questions at the end of those sermons. And those sermons, uh, those questions are for you during our response time as we continue to worship, to consider. You can write these things down. You can take a picture of the screen. You can do whatever it is that you need to do, but they're also pointing toward our short-term community group, uh, groups that are meeting in homes, so much of the conversation around the video that's watched uh, is also related to these things and what we've been talking about here in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. So uh, I'm going to pray, uh, and then uh, we'll continue to worship. Father, we thank you that, Lord, by your Spirit, you have given us more than we've ever deserved, more than we could have ever imagined. And that's not just for the life to come, though it is. It's for the life that we have now. It's for this place that you have us in. Whether we live here in Auburn or we're just passing through, Lord, I pray that everything we do beyond the walls of this building would point people to you. 
would speak of your grace and your love and of your freedom and of your life and of your limitless power and ability to save the broken, to save the lost, to, to heal the dying. And so Jesus, we pray that you would remind us daily by your spirit that it's all about where we set our minds in terms of starting our day, starting our week, starting this moment that you've given me. I set my mind on you, Christ, and believe that that will affect my heart and that will affect the way I live. We choose you, we choose the life in you, Christ, because you have chosen us first, you have loved us first. So this is simply our response to live the life that you made us to be and that you saved us to be. And Lord, we say thank you, we worship you, we love you here in this place. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.